In the realm of blockchain innovation where trust is etched in code and the promise of decentralization echoes through the corridors of this industry, a critical question emerges. Are we veering off course? Elements designed to enhance its utility are stirring debates, igniting fears and challenging its foundational principles. Self-proclaimed purists warn of this significant threat, arguing that these innovations threaten the very ethos of blockchain. But are these fears justified, or do they signify a deeper, more profound evolution within the blockchain space? Could it be that the path to maintaining libertarian values, realizing true decentralization and achieving mass adoption lies not in rejecting these innovations, but instead by redefining them? What if the fears of centralization are just the beginning of a new chapter where a balance of embracing innovation and incorporating it into an already largely decentralized blockchain will enable it to evolve into something far more akin to an ultra-inclusive world financial and social operating system, discovering a future where decentralized technology and freedom can truly coexist harmoniously? Welcome back to Cardano Insights and part 4 in the series Cardano for Bitcoiners where we analyse criticisms, misconceptions and popular narratives in the view to find valuable common ground between two hugely influential blockchain communities. In today's episode, we delve into concerns surrounding the centralisation of blockchain treasuries, programmable assets and decentralised identifiers. Just before we dive in, if you haven't already, be sure to catch up on the first three installments of this series. It's highly recommended for a full perspective on this big blockchain topic. All will be linked in the video description below, or you can navigate to the main Cardano Sapien YouTube page. They don't need to be viewed in chronological order, so for now, let's get straight into part four. So first up, let's talk the power of native assets and concerns surrounding the centralization of programmable assets in blockchain. Bitcoin's native asset standard refers to Bitcoin itself being the primary and intrinsic digital asset of the Bitcoin blockchain. Unlike many tokens on alternative blockchains such as Ethereum that are created and governed by smart contracts, therefore programmable, Bitcoin is inherently integrated into its own blockchain's protocol. This means Bitcoin serves as both the unit of account and medium of exchange within its network, ensuring its decentralized nature and security are maintained by the network's consensus mechanism. As a native asset, Bitcoin's existence, value and transactions are all directly managed by the Bitcoin blockchain, independent of external platforms or intermediaries. This means as a Bitcoin holder, you have the ability to harness true self-custody, maintaining full control over the storing, spending and transfer of it as a digital currency. The native asset standard and blockchain technology is the very enabler to be your own bank, a phrase that's commonly celebrated as one of cryptocurrency's most empowering and liberating features. The decentralized qualities of the native asset standard means that Bitcoiners are generally anti-programmable assets, which has given birth to the likes of central bank digital currencies in blockchain. Bitcoin's decentralized nature means that no single entity controls it. This contrasts greatly with the centralized control of CBDCs by banks or other programmable smart contract assets, which enables a centralized entity to control the asset through actions such as clawbacks or asset freezes. This fundamental difference goes against Bitcoin's core principle of decentralization and self-custody. Additionally, Bitcoin transactions offer a high level of privacy, unlike CBDCs, which could allow for increased government surveillance and complete loss of financial privacy. Fundamentally, Bitcoiners value true financial freedom and control over their own assets without intermediaries. In contrast, CBDCs could enable central banks to implement restrictive policies like negative interest rates, the freezing of accounts, limiting of transaction types, or even full asset seizure. Bitcoin's native asset is censorship resistant, preventing transactions from being blocked or reversed. This is in direct opposition to CBDCs or programmable assets, which enable such censorship characteristics. Philosophically, many Bitcoiners embrace libertarian or anti-establishment views opposing the increased government or centralized controls associated with CBDCs or smart contract controlled assets. Bitcoin is seen as a pioneering innovation that challenged the traditional financial system, while programmable assets are considered a major risk to this and in many cases as attempts to stifle this competition. These factors collectively drive Bitcoin as fierce opposition toward programmable assets in blockchain. But where does Cardano's blockchain architecture stand on the subjects of native or programmable assets? Well, Cardano was also intentionally designed with the native asset standard, meaning just like Bitcoin, ADA and all other Cardano tokens are native to the Cardano blockchain. This means ADA and all other tokens minting on Cardano are native assets and fully decentralized. From an asset perspective, one of the biggest misconceptions or mistakes Bitcoiners make when assessing Cardano is that they draw conclusions based on what they see in Ethereum's design choices. Whilst Cardano does have smart contracts, they do not govern or control its tokenized assets. 
In reality, Cardano's architecture based on its native asset standard should also be viewed as anti-CBDC and after Bitcoin is probably the worst blockchain if you want CBDCs or centralized control over programmable assets. Its native asset standard shares the same characteristics as Bitcoin, meaning there is no fear of clawbacks, asset freezes or other centralized controls. The ownership of assets on Cardano is entirely decentralized. This is one of the many commonalities between Bitcoin and Cardano. The beauty of Cardano native assets is that it's not exclusive to ADA. Any token created on the Cardano blockchain falls under the native assets standard. This means all tokens have the same decentralized qualities and are treated equally to ADA on chain in this respect. Bitcoin attempted something similar with the idea of color coins. This concept involved coloring specific Bitcoins with metadata to signify they represent another asset. However, colored coins never gained widespread adoption due to technical limitations and the complexity of its implementation. It did however from my understanding inspire Cardano to create its own unique native asset standard that one could argue is the most innovative and decentralized across the entire blockchain space. As a result of Cardano's native multi-asset support, users can transact in ADA and an unlimited number of user-designed custom tokens natively. Like Bitcoin, there is no need to create smart contracts to handle native tokens, which removes a layer of added complexity and potential for manual errors since the ledger handles all token-related functionality. So from a Cardano and Bitcoin point of view, the argument isn't which blockchain has the most decentralized asset standard, because we've established already they are largely equal in this respect, but rather which blockchain from an asset perspective displays the most evolutionary potential and libertarian principles. Enter Cardano improvement proposal SIP113. Whilst this has not yet been implemented, if developed, it will enable the implementation of programmable assets or assets with clawbacks on Cardano. Separate to Cardano's native asset standard, these programmable assets could for example be marked in wallets with an identifier so that the user understands if it is indeed native to the blockchain or not. The introduction of this SIP would demonstrate that Cardano is giving full freedom to its users. Who are we to outlaw asset types and dictate which type of assets, irrespective of their centralized or decentralized characteristics, can be used or interacted with on a decentralized blockchain? While native assets are the default and in my opinion the superior asset type, if we require programmable assets to fuel further adoption, then this is possible on Cardano. That's true freedom. It's important to remember that SIP113, or the programmable asset standard that's being proposed, was not built into the chain like on Ethereum, and is instead an upgradable feature of Cardano. On Ethereum, everything is a smart contract token, therefore it's impossible to know what is a centralized asset that could be subject to clawbacks or freezes, and which isn't. So much so that on Ethereum, you'll never know what type of asset you are dealing with. On Cardano, just like Bitcoin, we started from first principles but then iterate or evolve from this point. In fact, if Cardano chose not to introduce this SIP, then it actually centralizes the chain in as much as it demonstrates how we are not accepting of non-libertarian principles. It's a paradox of tolerance. We are not fully decentralized if we do not enable what is in theory a centralized asset standard. To some degree, it's Cardano's tolerance for what are perceived as potentially centralizing features from the outside that makes many intolerant of it as a blockchain. This I think highlights again how Cardano is proving to be everything crypto promised to be. Cardano is a primary not on all and is evidently built differently. It cannot be compared to Ethereum, it's a completely different beast. The problem stems when these intricacies are not communicated to the rest of the industry. Just because Cardano has smart contract capabilities and also the potential to introduce programmable assets, this shouldn't be viewed in a negative light and take away from its initial design choices and first principles foundation it was built upon. Upgrading or iterating the blockchain to accommodate more use cases, utility and potential user solutions should be a feature that's celebrated in blockchain. The system should be decentralized and with this it means that anyone can introduce different features that may appeal to different users. If you have a decentralized programmable ledger, this can't be prevented. This doesn't mean everyone has to conform or interact with that aspect, but it does ensure you maintain the most libertarian values industry-wide, able to accommodate any feature a user may need. The fact that Bitcoin doesn't evolve and is so vehemently opposed to many innovations means that it's stuck in the mud in this respect and inadvertently or intentionally limiting its users, which is fundamentally an extremely centralized characteristic. The introduction of programmable assets on Cardano would for example open up the pathway to incorporate indeed in stablecoins or uncollateralized lending solutions. 
Whilst this may not be of interest to a decentralization maxi or all types of users, it can't be argued that this would deliver far more inclusivity, freedom and choice for all users of the blockchain. In essence, the chain that embraces or incorporates both highly decentralized alongside potentially centralizing user features is actually demonstrating the most decentralized and libertarian approach of them all. Now it's no secret that Cardano has a treasury which currently stands at approximately 1.5 billion ADA. This is a feature that is intended to contribute to the self-sustainability of the protocol for the years and decades to come. Many from the Bitcoin community hold the opinion that this treasury is completely centralized and therefore makes Cardano as a protocol extremely centralized also. This statement however fails to give a fair evaluation of its actual status and more importantly how this aspect of Cardano is evolving with governance in real time. In reality, you could state that the Cardano treasury is already semi-decentralized in its current form and is for now controlled by its three founding entities, IOG, Emergo and the Cardano Foundation. But rather than criticizing Cardano for where it is today, I think it's best to judge it based on its roadmap and governance development status, which provides more clarity on where it intends on journeying towards. Cardano is fast moving in the direction of decentralized treasury management. With the introduction of SIP 1694, Cardano's members-based organization and delegated representatives through Intersect, a founding institution, the Cardano treasury will no longer be managed by the founding entities, but rather in direct cooperation with the Cardano community, who will ultimately decide how this treasury is spent and maintained. Whilst the introduction of DREPs and Intersect will somewhat further decentralize the treasury with additional checks and balance, SIP1694 is not the end of governance and will certainly not make Cardano from a governance perspective fully decentralized. This is only the beginning and through an organic community powered inclusive process, governance on Cardano will become more decentralized over time. The Chang Hard Fork and introduction of SIP1694 marks a huge milestone for the project in terms of governance, yet in its initial stage, as we've discussed through various topics in this series, an element of trust is still required in order to see it through to realize its grand vision. Decentralization can be measured, but I don't believe 100% decentralization exists. It's a continuous process that has no final end game target or number, but instead can in theory keep increasing. If there is one thing Cardano has demonstrated consistently is that through an iterative process, the system as a whole has continued to decentralize more and more over time as intended. This same approach will be taken to build out its governance and treasury management model. This is the beauty of evolution and something that is lost on many Bitcoin maximalists whose mindset is that everything is or ought to be a one and done type deployment. Cardano governance is an unwritten storyline that isn't going to be decided by fate or its initial framework, but rather by its community. You can join now, contribute and have a say in the direction you want governance and the protocol development to evolve or contribute in five years time when it's far more matured and well oiled. The point is, in contrast to Bitcoin, Cardano is not a static system. Anyone is welcome to help contribute to ultra decentralize it. A great example of how treasury management could be progressively more decentralized on Cardano is that post the Voltaire hard fork where decentralized governance will initially be turned on, it will be possible on Cardano to evolve into a smart contract treasury management system. This means that a delegated representative could also be a smart contract as well as a human, effectively enabling users to vote and the decentralized smart contract representative could access the treasury. This is the direction where Cardano is heading. A delegated representative can also be a Plutus contract. The consequence of this is that you could have a DREP which roll ups or compresses the voices of thousands of people. This effectively allows you to build a virtual DREP backed by an on-chain voting platform where you can ask your voters to make an irreversible decision. Once the decision is made, it's the smart contract that will make sure that a human DREP cannot change this decision, effectively executing and enforcing the community's decision. Smart contract developers on Cardano are beginning to get extremely efficient on-chain data structures to actually be able to make this a reality and work really well. Criticizing centralized aspects of the Cardano treasury in its current state is fair, but failing to acknowledge the movement occurring in real time concerning its attempt to realize truly decentralized governance and importantly, Cardano's community and infrastructure's ability to execute it is a major oversight. If the community gets it right, the unlocking of 1.5 billion ADA to help bootstrap development, sustain the growth of its ecosystem and continue to decentralize this process will make Cardano home to the largest decentralized innovation fund in existence. 
Now, the final area of centralization in blockchain that we'll discuss today is the emergence of DIDs, or decentralized identifiers, that enable verifiable decentralized digital identity. Bitcoin has criticized Cardano and any blockchain for that matter who have demonstrated a willingness to develop and incorporate DIDs as part of their blockchain infrastructure. Bitcoiners are generally opposed to decentralized identifiers due to several key concerns rooted in their philosophical and technological principles. A primary issue is centralization, as Bitcoiners highly value a decentralized network and view DIDs as potentially introducing new points of control or failure. Privacy is another significant concern. While DIDs aim to enhance digital identity management, they involve handling personal data, which raises fears of privacy breaches or misuse. Evidently, Bitcoiners also prioritize simplicity in technology design, adhering to the keep it simple stupid principle. They often perceive DIDs as adding unnecessary complexity and fear that integrating identity management could dilute Bitcoin's original purpose as a decentralized currency. Security is another critical factor, with concerns that DIDs could introduce new vulnerabilities and attack vectors to the Bitcoin network. Ultimately, it would seem that trust is a fundamental issue for Bitcoiners who emphasize trust minimization. Any system requiring trust in certain entities or intermediaries is viewed with suspicion. Additionally, there are apprehensions about regulatory implications, fearing that formalized digital identity systems could lead to increased surveillance or control by government or corporations, leading to mandated transactions. Overall, the opposition to DIDs among Bitcoiners is driven by concerns about centralization, privacy, complexity, security, trust, and regulatory overreach, reflecting their commitment to maintaining Bitcoin's core decentralized principles. Because Bitcoin is immutable, governments can't forcefully attach the identity of a person into a Bitcoin transaction. To retain privacy and control, Bitcoiners say that they will remain completely peer-to-peer, -peer, but in reality, governments still have the ability to make Bitcoin suffer. We have examples like ZK Cash and Monero, who are suffering from maintaining a 100% privacy approach, limiting adoption through the exclusion of ETFs and limited exchange listings. The introduction of DIDs for certain jurisdictions could have a positive impact on adoption and satisfy regulators at retail consumer level. The incorporation of DIDs, however, circles back to this idea of maintaining a libertarian approach to blockchain development. The Cardano Foundation, for example, has an identity wallet in development. The point of this is not to introduce elements of control, but instead for the system to give the user even more choice. In a truly decentralized system, you have the choice to interact with whatever aspects of it or use it however you see fit. The choice always remains on the user's side, and although only a very small portion of the blockchain would require DIDs, they would, without doubt, open further possibilities to drive adoption. For example, as we discussed with programmable assets, DIDs could enable uncollateralized loans through credit scoring. Whilst this wouldn't appeal to all blockchain users, this would be an entirely optional feature. Uncollateralized loans on blockchain would attract the potential for lots of new users and liquidity in DeFi. The combination of DIDs and programmable assets could service users who meet a credit scoring criteria but don't have the necessary collateral and attract users who wish to lend on chain in a more secure fashion. This examples how, in this use case, a user would be incentivized to share a DID, but are not forced to. Overall, a DID can also be viewed as an extremely libertarian feature. A blockchain can have various identity systems offering freedom and choice. Most importantly, using zero-knowledge proofs, a DID also enables choice to what user information is revealed. It's the user who controls the DID and can choose to share only relevant information or indeed just a proof that the information held within the DID itself satisfies with the request in order to interact with whatever specific part of the blockchain intended. On the surface level, it's understandable how programmable assets, protocol treasuries and DIDs can be characterized or viewed as extremely centralizing features of any blockchain. However, if the introduction of programmable assets is secondary to the default decentralized native asset standard, you have a clear pathway to decentralized governance and treasury management, in addition to incorporating DIDs as an optional, not mandatory feature that enables new use cases to further adoption, then I'd argue that this is the most decentralized and inclusive approach to blockchain's evolution that is more likely to prove sustainable than the largely dogmatic one spawned from Bitcoin maximalism. So that's it for part four in this series, Cardano for Bitcoiners. A huge thanks to everyone tuning in and supporting the channel. If you found value in this perspective or discovered something new today, please consider subscribing and hit that notification bell so you don't miss future installments. Part five is coming soon. Until next time, have a great week ahead and as always, keep it blockchain, keep it Cardano.